Titus, Titus chapter 3, Titus chapter 3, we're there in Sunday school uh, class this morning in Titus, verse number 10 where he told, he says, um, uh, not purloining but showing all good fidelity that, uh, that uh, they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. We talked about uh, making the things of God look beautiful in our life. You know, does the opinion, and I get it, it's, it's kind of difficult uh, trying to change the, the opinion uh, of the world about, in, in some regards, Christianity. Uh, everybody thinks, uh, you know, if you're not Buddha, if you're not Buddhist or Hindu or Islam, you must be some denomination of Christian. Um, and there are very, very many uh, split up factions of what people classify as uh, the, the Christian denominations. Um, but uh, my class, I told them this morning, but showing all good fidelity that, we, that they may adorn. And that word adorn, of course, this is chapter 2, verse 10. Is a, I'm just talking as a sidebar until you get to Titus chapter 3 there. Uh, adorn is to decorate. Decorate your life in such a way that people say, man, there's something different about that Christian thing, isn't it? There's something different about it. Uh, and we're supposed to adorn our lives in a fashion that uh, uh, we let our light shine. Uh, but I want to look across the page, Titus chapter 3, we're going to begin in verse number 1. Um, and uh, I will not be able to, uh, not that I won't be able to, but the point tonight will not be to uh, dismantle this portion of scripture verse by verse. I will not be systematically going to verse 1 and 2 and 3 and 4. We're going to read uh, a, oh, about 11 verses to give you a good portion of understanding and then I have a text verse that I want you to focus on. Titus chapter 3 starting in verse number 1 it says, put them in mind, put them in mind I was talking about Christians here, this is Paul's letter to Titus. Titus. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, and to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward men appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, let me say about uh, verse number 5 and verse number 7. Not by works of righteousness. Anybody thinks you've got to be good enough to go to heaven? That right there puts it to bed. Uh, and the Bible says uh, that that being justified by His grace. So what makes me justified? His grace. But not just His grace. His grace is abundant. His grace is there for us. But it must be believed on by me. I have to, I am partaker of His grace by believing on that grace. If I reject that grace, then I am no more justified. So it says that I am justified by His grace. And of course, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, uh, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works. Right? Not of works. So this is echoing that again. Paul says, not of works, not of works. It's His mercy. Um, uh, and, and then verse number 7, that being justified by His grace. All right? Verse number 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that uh, they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. Uh, right here, that same old question. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies. That word genealogy, the first thing that comes to my mind is the question that I, all kinds of people have asked me. Where did Cain get his wife? That right there, Paul is telling Titus, dude, don't even spend time worrying about that stuff. 
Don't talk, don't spend your time worrying and fretting over all that stuff. Just lay out what you, what it is that you believe. To do some common sense there, and just let the chips fall where they may. If people like the answer; they like it. If they don't; they don't. You don't get caught up on that stuff. This is what I want you to focus on. So he says, don't get caught up on that genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, uh, for they are unprofitable and vain. They're in vain, empty. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing, knowing that he is such is, uh, that that is such is subverted and sinneth, beginning uh, or being condemned of himself. But what I want to focus on here tonight is chapter three, verse eight. Chapter three, verse eight. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will uh, I will that thou affirm constantly. That they which believe in, believed in God, might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Uh, I want to preach to you tonight, more like a, long, a lesson. I don't know how preachy I'll get, but I want to uh, preach on the message, how to do right all your life. How to do right all your life. How to do right all your life. Heavenly Father, help us to grasp this truth tonight. Help us to do right. Do right. I've heard it said before, do right till the stars fall. Do right if the stars fall. Do right. Do right. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to do right. We need your help to do it by your grace. We can do it. Oh, Heavenly Father, uh, as I, I, I read in that message from, from Deuteronomy this morning, where, where Pastor Jackson was reading, and it said, if we observe to do, all these blessings and all this righteousness comes about if we observe to do. But Heavenly Father, help us to observe to do it. Observe it and then do it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask you the question tonight, why is it that some Christians have been saved for years and you've never and they've never read their Bible through from cover to cover? Why is it that some Christians have been saved for years and uh, we can't remember if it was Noah or Moses that built the ark? <laughs> Why is it that some folks, some, some Christians have been saved for years, years, and there's, there's no, there's no uh, biblical literacy? Uh, they've never, been, they've never wrote, read, written or wrote the Bible, read the Bible through from cover to cover. How many, well, I, I, I'll, I'll move on. Why is it that some Christians have been saved for years and have never told anybody about Jesus? They don't go soul winning. Why is it that some people have been saved for years and then Christians, and I mean Christians, Christians, and they don't and they don't pray regularly? Why is it that some Christians have been saved for years and yet they're not faithful in tithing, they're not faithful in giving, they're not faithful in missions, they're not faithful in uh, supporting camp, they're not in, they're not they don't they're not involved in a ministry? Why is it that some Christians have been saved for years and years and yet find it hard to be faithful to each service. Uh, one preacher said it's three to thrive, two to survive, and one. One just to barely stay alive. Three to thrive, two to stay alive, and one to barely survive. Uh, I, I credit being present in church to, to help me. I, maybe I wasn't in the boat, but I was on the line. You know what I mean? I, was, I, I wasn't in the boat, but Jesus had me on the hook. Being in church, it, it was everything I needed. It was a kick in the pants when I needed it to be. It was a hug and an embrace when I needed it to be. And it wasn't that the people kicked me when I needed it. And don't go on while I'm kicking your people. Kick your people here, okay? But they just look like they needed a kick in the pants. Well, that's called assault. Don't do that. Uh, you know, uh, uh, somebody comes to church you haven't seen in a while, and you're going to, no, you, we love on it. But it wasn't necessarily um, the, the, that I felt the love from the people or felt the correction from the people. It was I felt the love from the Word of God. And it was I felt the correction from the Word of God. It was everything that I always needed. It was because the Word of God was open and somebody preached it. I can't tell you how many times I came in here before I was voted in as pastor that, um, you know, I, I, I'd get back in town from driving a truck and, and, and uh, from working and I'd come in in my work clothes or um, I, I'd get out of, I mean, I had just a few different jobs, mainly driving a truck though. And how many times I just barely made it here? How many times I just barely made it here? Uh, and um, I just had a horrible week, but yet it was, I need to get in church. 
I need to get a church. Church has always been, for me personally, a well or a spring in a desert. It was a, 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 a shade tree and, and, and a place that the sun just bakes you. So church has always been a saving grace. Church has been something that um, all I have to do is show up. I can do that. It doesn't take any talent to show up. I found it show. I found showing up to church easier than reading my Bible. I found showing up to church um, uh, easier than praying regularly because I didn't have to think about right words. I didn't think about having to try to dig out some truth out of Scripture. I, I didn't have to think about anything. I just needed to show up, and the Scriptures tell us. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith, and I, need, I needed more faith. I wanted to trust the Lord more. I wanted blessings. I, I've been so familiar with the Bible from growing up in a church, growing up in a Christian home, and being in church. And, and I, I, I've spent more time in this building than any other building on planet Earth. More time in this facility than uh, uh, than uh, any of the houses that we live in. Because the house, you know, you wake up and our our life always revolved around um, the Christian school and vacation Bible school and Christian camp and youth conference and um, uh, uh, basketball and volleyball games when we had a traveling team and church services, of course, revival meetings and things like that. We were always here. First one's in, last one's out. And I don't, I don't. Uh, Regret any of it. I don't look back on it and disparage it. I don't look back and, and go, ah, man, we spent too much time there. I look at it and go, man, I think I am where I am today because we spent so much time here. Because we spent so much time around God's people and God's word. But there will come a time. There will come a time where mom and dad can't make me go to church anymore. Or mom and dad can't. And that time has come and passed a long time now. And I have my own wife and children now. I have my own family. And one day they'll grow up. And if they don't get these things, if they don't figure out how to do right all their life, my father said it this morning, there's still a great chance for me to fall flat on my face. I'm only 36. My, the oldest sibling we have is only 43. There's still a great opportunity for us to ruin our lives. There's still a great opportunity for us to fall down flat on our faces as for us as, as it is for you. But why is it that some Christians have been saved for all these years and never tell people about Jesus, never read their Bible through, don't pray regularly, uh, they find it hard to tithe or give or, or do for others. I had somebody tell me the other day about somebody else, uh, uh, and they said, um, not gossip, it was just an observation about a family member of theirs, and they said, that person is about themselves. That, and, they, and they didn't mean it disparaging, they just said, it's an observation, it's some sort of mechanism that's happened inside of them. That person's all about themselves. And I thought, man, how sad that is, that, that, a, that it's said of a Christian, that a Christian is all about themselves. Jesus Christ said the greatest person is selfless. Now, of course, he said is the servant, but a servant is selfless. A servant is selfless. A servant says, I'm here to serve you. The greatest of these, the greatest of people is a servant. A servant. Now, we have to, we have to progress as Christians. Uh, we, we, we have to move forward. Now, the question was is, why do so many Christians hit the brick wall of plateau? Why is it? And, and, I, and they hit it before they even grow. Now, of course, it's birth, struggle, growth, stag plateau, stagnation, decay, and death. All right. Well, a lot of Christians, they, they, they're born again. Man, they get saved. They get born again. Amen. I'm born again. I know that I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Okay, that's right. Well, you grew a little. There's a little bit of growth there. Little, you, you got yourself a Bible, and you started to attend Sunday morning services. All right. Well, why did you stop then? Well, why does that happen with so many Christians? We, I think we had a pretty decent crowd this morning. There's a pretty decent amount of people here. It was great. Well, where are they all now? Well, what happens to those people? I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, and, and granted, there's some there's some outliers. There's some people who went out of town. There's some people who don't feel well. But, but I'm talking about consistently where you say, Sunday morning's enough. Sunday morning's enough. Sunday morning's enough. That Christian has plateaued early. And they've stunted their growth. Well, 
Why? Why all that? Well, here's the answer. The answer is, is because they don't have, let's look at verse number eight. Three words I want to look out here. Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll put it all together, but um, uh, blah, 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 excuse me, yada, yada, yada. Some people don't like blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is a faithful saying, and these things, I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. That's good. Here, that's the answer. The answer of so many Christians plateauing early in life is because they fail to maintain good works. The good works of their life is I show up to church on Sunday morning, I put in a tithe. And that's it. I'm not saying they didn't hold a door open for somebody. I'm not saying they didn't help the neighbor get a cat out of their tree. I'm not saying that they didn't do something nice for somebody. What I'm saying is, is Christians aren't consistent into the graces in which we're supposed to grow. You said, Brother Jackson, one of the graces in which we're supposed to grow, uh, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, kindness, godliness, brotherly kindness. These things, these, these things we're supposed to grow in, uh, to grow in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We quit learning about Jesus. The, the uh, extent that many Christians know about Jesus is that he was born of a Virgin Mary in a manger. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. And, you know, we celebrate his resurrection on Easter. Okay, well, way to, way to fill in the highlights. But come on now. The scriptures tell us that if everything he did and said was to be recorded, that the volumes that it was written in, the earth couldn't contain it. Now, I don't know if that means... He did so much the earth couldn't contain it, or what he did was so powerful the world couldn't contain it. And I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to um, unpackage anything that, to get our minds wandering again because it says here, uh, uh, steer clear. He says steer clear away from these things, you know these uh, these genealogies and all these things that uh, uh, these questions. And there's nothing wrong with questions. But if you can't come to a conclusion, if you can't come to an end result on a mysterious thing of Scripture, well, two, two things there. The Holy Spirit's probably not ready for you to understand it. So the second thing would be to skip over it. Not if it's doctrine, something like that. Come, come talk to somebody, work it out. But folks, our text commands us to be careful to maintain good works. Maintaining good works. Too many Christians are haphazardly doing good works. We're accidentally doing good works. We're not doing them purposefully. And we're not doing them diligently. They do them for a while and then they quit for a while. They start, but then they don't maintain their good works. And what they do is, is they quit too easily. They quit too easily. I can't tell you how many times I've seen it on YouTube or I've seen somebody's reel something and it charges me up about, you know, being knocked down, getting back up, getting knocked down and getting back up. There's nothing wrong with failing. And there's nothing wrong with falling. There's everything wrong with staying down. Okay, understand that. That's where the failure comes in. It is not in a, it's not a failure to fail. It's a failure to stay down. It's a failure to say, oh, I guess that's the end of that, and quit. Absolutely not. You, so you found one of the ways not to do it. Found, find a way to do it. The scriptures tell us a just man, or and it doesn't say a man that will be just. It says a just man falleth seven times. Right. It's saying you will fall. Right. You will fall. Yeah. I want everybody to look, look at your hand. Look at it. Go ahead and take the other hand and pitch that skin right there. Pinch yourself somewhere. Don't pinch your neighbor. Pinch yourself. Amen. Uh, uh, you know what that is? That's flesh. That's flesh. Go ahead and feel that, that, um, that dense material under your skin. That's called bone. You're flesh and bone. You got blood. We, we pulled out a pocket knife. That's right. A pocket knife. Never man ought to carry a pocket knife. You, you got a pocket knife and you cut that skin, you're going to bleed. You're human. You're human. You're, you're going to fall. 
You're going to fail. And you may say, yes, but I'm a Christian. Uh, according to Scripture, I'm, I'm an heir with Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm blood-bought. I've been born again. I'm on my way to heaven. I'm a child of the King. Uh, yes. That's why it emphasizes a just man will fall. But guess what the just man does? He gets back up. Amen. He gets back up. Right. So I tell you this, don't quit too easily. Right. Don't quit too easily. So the scriptures tell us to be careful. Be careful. Or if you will, to be careful is to be diligent. Diligent, full of care. Attentive, alert, faithful in maintaining good works. Now I want to give you some very, uh, I want to give you a couple things tonight. Some things that I think are guidelines, guidelines to help you, help me, help us to keep doing right for the rest of your life. Now, wouldn't you like to think that? Wouldn't you like to think, man, I can get up every day and I can do right for the rest of my life? Uh, let's not let's not get it twisted there. There will be some some uh, some sprinkles of wrongdoing. There will be some, uh, you're going to have some sprinkled in there of some oops. <laughs> you're going to try to live right. You're going to say, this God I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm going to do what's right the best that I can. But you, you yeah, one day you're going to be out on a Sunday morning throwing that line in the water. <whistles> you know, singing the Andy Griffith song or whatever you're singing. And you're, and you're, and you're, you're reeling in that line and all of a sudden it's going to hit you. Holy Spirit's going to say, Today's Sunday? Oh yeah. Yeah, it is Sunday. You see, Sunday, Sunday morning church isn't a Sunday morning decision. It's a Saturday night decision. It's a sat it's a Saturday night decision. You plan on Sunday for Saturday. Uh, uh, unless you're spontaneous, that's all that's all great. But uh, um, this, these guidelines, it'd be wonderful to get up every day and say, I can do right for the rest of my life. And I, it doesn't mean I'll never fall, it doesn't mean I'll never make the wrong decision. It doesn't mean that I, I won't have some accidents there and, 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 and fall, but God's grace is sufficient for me and, and he'll, he'll help me and correct me. But you can do right for the rest of your life. And number one, number one, how to do right for the rest of your life. Number one, plan to do good works. Plan to do good works. Plan to do good works. You say, Brother Jackson, and now I'm sprinkling in my, my reap and reward sermon here, uh, but um, here's some things that you can plan to do. You can plan to go to church. You can plan to tithe. You can plan to serve to, to support a missionary. You can plan to tell somebody about Jesus. Give them a gospel track. You can plan to um, take your pastor out for dinner. <laughs> or breakfast or lunch. I don't discriminate food's food, amen. Uh, I, I don't even mind breakfast for dinner. Uh, and dinner for breakfast. No, all right, let's move on. Uh, you can plan. You can plan to do good works. Plan to do them. Plan. You're going to say, you know what? I'm going to go to church today, and I'm going to compliment somebody on whatever. I'm going to compliment them. You know what? I've known this so-and-so lately, and they, they look sad. You know, it may just be their face, so don't walk up and be like, hey, are you sad? Uh, but you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, I want to let you know I've been praying for you. God led you on my God led, God led you on my heart, and I just I just been praying for you, been thinking about you and praying for you. I don't know what you got going on in your life, and and you're not asking by the way you. You're not trying to pry. You're not trying to say what's, what's going on. Uh, and there's nothing wrong if they, if somebody wants to open up to you, then then be trustworthy enough to be to be confided in and not go spreading everybody's business all the time. But you can say, hey, I want to let you know I'm praying for you. Let you know that I'm thinking about you. But you say, um, uh, Brother Jackson, plan to do good works. Well, can you give me scripture for that? Oh, I can give you more scripture than you could probably handle on that about doing good works. But how about 2 Timothy 2.21? 2 Timothy, the other preacher boy that Paul was preaching to, he said, or that he wrote to, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel, a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Purge yourself from what? Well, let's just join with Titus where he says, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable in vain. And stay away from the heretics, by the way, as well. So he's saying, purge yourself from these things. The brawling and the fighting and, and all these other, these hateful desires that we have up here in verse 2 and 3. You know, he's saying, stay away from those things. 
Pull away from those things. And, and the Lord can prepare you into every good work. So I tell you tonight, uh, uh, I want you to write these down. Uh, pick out your goals. Pick out your goals. Prioritize them. And then plan your day. Pick out your goals. Prioritize them. And then plan your day. Uh, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Jackson, Dr. Donnelly, and Dr. Gray have all been a help to me in that regard. Where all three of them have told me, your schedule, your schedule, your schedule, your schedule. Let your schedule be your guide. Miss Jennifer and I just had a little bit of a chuckle up here where she said something about having a to do a, a to do list, and I said yes. And then I turned to that to do list and I say, I'm not doing what you say. Uh, you know, we're adults. We don't have to do what our schedule tells us to do. Uh, but if you have scheduled good works in there, good works usually mean there are other people involved. And if you don't do those good works, you're also letting those people down that you plan on doing good works yeah, for. Right. So I tell you again, when you plan to do good works, pick out your goals. Pick out the works. Prioritize them. And then plan your day. All right, number two. Number two, pray for guidance and strength. Pray for guidance and strength. How can I do good my whole life? How can, now imagine, imagine from this day forward, you say, all right, I'm going to start planning to do good works. I'm going to pick them out. I'm going to plan, prioritize them. I'm going to, excuse me, I'm going to pick them. I'm going to prioritize them. And then I'm going to plan to, plan to do them. All right, when I go to do that, when I, when I sit down and I go to do that, from this day forward, I'm going to go ahead and do that. Now imagine, folks, the Bible says, lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. How do you, how do you go about laying up treasures in heaven? Right here. Good works. Good works. Right. Good works. Good works. Good works. Good works. You know, the, 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 whichever Jackson boy of mine decides to be... Um, they want to be uh, top of the list for dad's will. It's going to be the son, but it's probably just going to be Emmy anyway, because she's my one and only daughter. Um, Emmy gets everything, and she'll divide it up amongst her brothers. <laughs> smile, Crab, smile. Uh, but um, uh, man, here I have, uh, you know, I, I got, I have this son. Man, he cuts the grass without being told to. He takes out the trash. He's respectful to his mother. He, man, he helps his little brothers. He, <laughs> or his older brothers for that matter. He's this child of mine is incredibly helpful to the household. They're diligent. They take care of what they've been given. They hang up their suit clothes. They put their shoes where they go. They rinse their dishes. They throw away their trash. They share with their brothers. Now that kid doesn't exist. But but you, you get the idea that there's there's an attempt to be made to be well behaved. To help the household thrive and go. All right, well, God looks down on his children and he sees who are working for the kingdom. Who are those who are doing good works and are being a representative, a representative of who I am? Who, 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 who what child of that, what child is there that will do those good works? Is God laying up treasure in heaven for you? Uh, is, is You can answer that according to your works. Now again, I segue that into um, uh, very quickly number two where I said pray, pray for guidance and strength. The Bible says in Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many times I've said to you and you've said to me, man, I want to, I want to go soul winning for five hours, but my flesh can't do it. I want to love people, but man, those people make it so hard. You say, I want, I want to love people, but man, my flesh, I want to, I, 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 the spirit inside of me, I have this desire to serve God, but the flesh holds me back. Man, folks, we need to pray. We need to pray. Now, praying is asking. So that's why I said pray for guidance and strength. Folks, you need help to see your path. You need help to see your path. You need help to stay on your path. And you need help to steer around obstacles. 
and you need help to sustain in your weariness and your tiredness. You need help. You need help. I don't care how independent you are and how self-sufficient you are. If you're trying to live this Christian life, you're not going to be able to do it on your own. And you're going to need you're going to need the help from God. And David said it, my help, my help comes from above. My help comes from God. My help comes from the throne of heaven where God sits and I can't do it on my own. I can't preach sermons on my own. I can't love my wife on my own. As, as, as a, a, just a, a, a man, I need God's help. I can't raise my children for God on my own. I need God's help. I can't be the pastor and the Christian and the citizen and the husband and the father and the son and the friend. All that I have to be, all that I need to be, I can't do it on my own. I need help. I need it. And you need it. We need it. So when I pray, I consistently ask God, God, help me to see the path you've laid out for me. God, help me to stay on track. God, help me to get around the obstacles. And God, help me when I'm tired. God, help me when I'm tired. You know, when we do that, when we'll pray that way, we get something called a second win. A second win. Uh, we have this little gym downstairs in the basement here. My dad was on this uh, elliptical bike that we have. And he got on it, and the first time he was on for five minutes, five minutes, seven seconds, or something like that. Uh, and he's like, oh, that's pathetic, you know. Uh, and he started talking, but but then he got off of it, and he kept stretching, and he kept doing these deep knee bends and uh, kind of different things like that. And he tried to put in a, um, a Richard Simmons video, and I was like, no, Dad, we're not doing that. <laughs> Some of y'all know. Uh, but, um, uh, uh, and, and we, you know, we're not, you know, uh, uh, but the next time he got on that bike, it was nearly eight minutes. It was nearly eight minutes. You see, uh, he got something called a second wind. Right. A second wind. Where, yes, you can go on. You just don't think you can. You went as far as you could go on your own. And I, the, I applaud you. And I really mean it. So many people, they, man, they, they go all out. They do all that they can do in their own strength. And it's phenomenal. Imagine what you could do if you make the Lord your partner. Imagine the impact that you could have, the difference that you could make, the power that you could obtain, the knowledge that you could come in contact with, the power, the wisdom, the knowledge of Almighty God. And you have a part of that. And the Holy Spirit of God will use you as a vessel to impart who He is. Titus 2.10, adorning yourself. Adorning yourself with these the, the, the things of God, the doctrine of God, our Savior. Now, we get that second win. Imagine what you could do if you just didn't, if you didn't do it on your own all the time. And if you asked the Lord for help. Number one, number one, plan to do good work, plan to do good works. Number two, pray for guidance and strength. And number three, put aside the weights already. Put aside the weights already. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed, surrounded with, about with a so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. And what does a weight do? What does a weight do? Man, I'll tell you what a weight will do. Where's Lincoln? Come here, Lincoln. Come up here. Come here. Hustle. Run, 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 run. Run. That's your running? All right. Come here. Uh, grab a chair. Okay. Uh, stand on. Get on my back. Jump. Jump up here. Okay. Jump. He doesn't jump. Run. He doesn't run. He's a disobedient child. Ah, this is Lincoln. He's my nine-year-old son. Here I am. I have Lincoln on my back. He's not really that heavy. Uh, not yet, anyway. Not until he gets like his older brothers. Um, but what does a weight do? What does a weight do? I'll tell you what a weight does. A weight distracts you. Could you imagine if I got up here to preach every Sunday morning, I put this kid on my back? 
I was sitting here and trying to preach, and, and Thaddeus and Brother uh, uh, Frank and, and Dr. Kohasi, I could sit and stand here for a little while and begin to relay my truth. But do you know what this weight is doing right now? It's distracting you, and it's distracting me. My weights, can you loosen up the choking me? These, these weights, they distract. They distract. That's what they do. Now, if I was to, uh, oh, come down here and say, all right, uh, the goal here is to get to the back of the auditorium as fast as I could. You know what this weight's going to do to me? It's going to delay me. This weight's going to slow me down. Thank you, Mr. Weight. This guy, if I had him on my back for the, for the whole journey, he's going to distract me. He's going to distract me. Not the scenery of beauty, but what kind of distraction? Man, this thing's heavy. Man, when can I get this thing off of here? Hey, wait, can you go on a diet? Hey, wait, and listen, this weight right here, of course we're not talking about, you know, a bag of sand. We're talking about your, the baggage from your past life. Wow. We're talking about the baggage from the mistakes you've made. Good. And by the way, I, your past life could have been yesterday. Yeah, come on. You could have you could have gotten right with God today. That's right. Yesterday could have been hell on earth for you, and today's a new beginning. Come and on. you've got heaven before you. Amen. But bless God, if you don't lay aside the weights, if you sorry, give him one flash here. And if you don't lay aside the weights, it's gonna distract you. It's going to get you thinking about that's why Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind. I press toward the mark, the high calling of God. I'm going to look forward, not behind, and await. Yes, it weighs you down, thank you, Lincoln. But it, 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 uh, it distracts you. It distracts you. You can't think on when the scriptures tell us, hey, whatsoever, Philippians 4 8, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are you know, uh, honest, whatsoever things are. Okay, think on these things. Think on these good things. How in the world can we as Christians who've been saved for all this amount of time think on these things if we're thinking about our weights? Okay, not only does it distract you, but it delays you. It will slow you down. It will slow you down. You know, uh, you've been saved uh, four, five, six, seven years. The, the Lord has maybe, maybe has a plan for you to be a Sunday school teacher. Maybe he's, he, he has a plan to call you to the mission field. Maybe he has a plan for you to work with um, uh, uh, people in uh, uh, the jails or uh, 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 drug centers or recovering centers or, or whatever it may be. And yet you have these weights that you can't put down. You can't put aside the weight because it's distracting you, but it, it's also slowing you down, which is delaying you. You are not reaching your Christian mountaintops when you should be reaching them because you're being delayed. You're being delayed. And then the last thing that a weight does is a weight diminishes or shrinks your capacity for anything else. If you are carrying the weight of the past, you cannot carry the capacity of a vision and hope for the future. That's right. You know why you never have dreams of doing anything for God? Because you're, you're, you're thinking about the weights. It's true. You don't ever think about becoming something for God and doing something for God and a, a daydreaming in a righteous sense because you, you're spending too much time regretting the past. The capacity for dreams and goals and visions of the future of doing something bright and hopeful and wonderful and powerful through Jesus' name are never dreamt are never realized, are never met because the capacity for those things are diminished because the weights of the past and the burdens of the past and the weights, the stumbling blocks of the present take up too much space now. You take it out now. I, I, I put it this way. Uh, make room in the garage for the muscle car you want in the future. Well, how do you do that? You get rid of all the stuff that's in the way now. Now I'm not saying you're going to have a muscle car. Maybe it's a, a motorcycle. Uh, you know, maybe maybe it's a, a boat. You know, I, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's a you know, whatever the case. Whatever the case, you can't get, you can't replace that space with something good for the future until all that old stuff is moved and cleaned out and cleared out. So it distracts you. 
Number four, number four. So uh, number three was put aside the weights. Number four, perform the good works. Hey, isn't this diabolical? Hey, how to do good all your life? Do good. How can I do good my whole life? Well, you, you just, you do good. Do good. You perform the good works. 2 Corinthians 8.11. 2 Corinthians 8.11. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. I love how you say, how do I do that? And the Bible says, this is how. 2 Corinthians 8.11 says, now, therefore, perform the doing of it. Man, I want to see this church grow again. I want to see the buses rolling. I want to see this. I want to see that. I want to kind of harness what we used to do and do it again, Lord. All right, good. Now, perform the doing of it. You say, well, how? Here's how. Hello, my name is uh, Jake Jackson. This is uh, Brother Frank I'm from Three Baptist Church. Um, if it's um, uh, Lucas out knocking doors, it's... It's the police! You know? <laughs> Lucas pounds on doors, you know? So, Calm down, son. You, you don't want them to hide. You want them to go, oh, we have a visitor. And so, it's Jesus, cops. Uh, I don't know if it says cheese it anymore, but you know, I heard it somewhere. Uh, but uh, it says, Now therefore perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will. So do do it like you were ready to do it, like you want to do it. Sing in the choir because you were ready to do it. Tithe because you were ready to do it. Come to church because you were ready to do it. Now perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which he hath. Performance. Performance. Now, what do I say about that? Do it with, uh, uh, I like, we call it alliteration. I'm going to explain to you what that is another time just so I can be done with this. Even though this is good truth, I, I kind of feel like I don't want to uh, uh, stop, but I'm right by my conclusion. Do it with promptness. Do it with promptness. Man, be on time. Be on time. Be on time. Be on time. Man, if I go to, if I buy Titan, uh, tickets for a Detroit Tigers game because we're Detroit Tigers fans. Um, if we buy uh, 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 tickets to a Tigers game and um, uh, we live in Fort Wayne and Detroit's a, a few hours up the road there, you better believe I'm showing up in the first, in, before the first inning. I'm getting my money's worth. I'm not going to show up in the third inning, the fourth inning. I'm not, I'm not doing that. I'm showing up on time. I want to get all that I can out of this. All right, so do it with promise. Perform that, do it with promptness, don't delay, do it right away. Secondly, do it with pleasure. Man, I've noticed in my, in, in my Christian life, and, and I have been the one as well, but I'm getting ready to, to um, sort of condemn the, this attitude. I have been the one to have the attitude sometimes. Uh, I say do it with pleasure, do it with pleasure. How many times has it been trying to get me to do what I'm supposed to do is like trying to pull teeth? Man, I don't want to do that. And I get it. Sometimes you're tired. Sometimes you're sick. Sometimes you're down and out. But I, I get all that. I'm not. There's a thousand reasons, but very, very few excuses. Very few excuses of why man, we are serving the the God of all gods, the God of creation, the God that said, "Let there be," and there was. I read this morning the God who created light, the God who demands light and darkness, good and evil. That God is my Father. Why would I not serve Him with pleasure? And thirdly, thirdly, do it with persistence. Don't give up. Don't give up. Don't give up. We've all heard. We've all heard of people who 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 quit right at the finish line. We've all heard of people who, man, they they had that, they were mining, you know, and they were they were picking away and picking away and picking away and picking away, and they got a, you know they got a mile in the mountain, couldn't find anything. Yet they were one foot away and they quit picking. They quit, they quit mining. They quit looking. But it was the guy who said, no, I'm going to tunnel through the mountain if, if that's what it takes me. I'll tunnel through the mountain range if, that, if that's what it takes me. But I'm going to keep going. Folks, persistence. The difference between failure and success is that word persistent. If you'll be persistent, you'll find success. You'll find success. I try to teach that with my kids. I, and I know they get bothered with me. We want to go out and shoot hoops. And before you know it, it turns into a coaching lesson. But I tell them over and over and over and over and over again, you can't be out here for 30 minutes and think you're going to master the game. It's going to take 30 minutes and it's going to take three hours every 
day of your life to master this thing. You want to be the best of, uh, you want to be the best on the court in a pickup game? Then you need to be out here every day putting the ball through that hoop. Or at least throwing it that way and throwing it that way. I don't care if you miss 99 times. Don't you walk inside this house until you hit a shot. You know, that that's what it takes in anything in life is persistence. Persistence. So why is it that Christians, they slink into the doors of a church on a Sunday morning, hoping, which is fine, hoping and pleading and begging with God that they'll hear something that will help them, and then they do. Dr. Boazzi, they do get help. And then they walk out going, well, I guess I don't need to go back for another year now. Could you imagine how much help you'd get if you come back again and 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 again? I mean, your life would be changed. You'd be transformed by the renewing of your mind to be made like Christ. So I conclude tonight, we said there's two kinds of maintenance. Remember where he said, careful to maintain good works. Titus 3 verse 8, careful to maintain good works. There's two kinds of maintenance. There's preventative maintenance. Preventative maintenance. That's uh, taking care of problems before they occur. And if you talk to um, uh, uh, oh, uh, Brother Warren Storm, we, we, we talked about this uh, at length. And um, Brother Monty Watts, who's in heaven now. Um, and by the way, I was thinking we could get um, Brother Monty Watts, we could get Bill Boyd, we could get Brother Evans, and get, get them up on the wall somewhere. Good idea. Um, uh, and these men who've had an influence here in relationship with us over the years. Um, but uh, uh, Brother Warren Storm, who's of course Mr. Bus, uh, preventative maintenance, which means taking care of problems before they occur. Taking care of problems before they occur. And there's also, it, I, I wrote down corrective, but Brother Warren Storm and I call it breakdown maintenance. Breakdown maintenance. Taking care of problems after they occur. Now that's not the way to go. Now, sometimes life is going to hand you that, and you're just going to have to deal with it. You know, a lot of people want to try to figure out how to get along with their ex, ex-wife, ex-husband. And they want to try to get along that way. I, I get it. When the water's under the bridge, there's nothing you can do about it. But if you're, if you're married now, you know, Jamie and I will stay married as long as I perform preventative maintenance. But if I just let things go and let things go and let things go and let things go, and one day Jamie and I, our, our, our marriage breaks apart, we uh, we end up being divorced. To which I, I would never think that, never say that, but for illustration here, um, everybody thinks, well, well, now that we're broken up, let's figure out how we can get along the best way. Why didn't you ask yourself that when you were married? How can we get along? How can we make this right? How can we how can we get along in life? How can you love me and I love you and we do it the right way? How can we share smiles and tears of life together? How can we get to, man, I, I want to make you my life partner and you want to make me your life partner and we joined ourselves in holy matrimony. Okay, let's figure that out and let's try to do that. But we don't, we as humans, we neglect preventative maintenance. We let it go, 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 we let it go. We let it go. And when it breaks, we say, okay, now we have to do corrective maintenance. And corrective maintenance, if you ask Brother Storm, he'll always tell you, breakdown maintenance is always much more uh, uh, financially taxing than preventative maintenance. It's a lot easier to change the oil than it is to change an engine. To change the oil. Yeah. Now, what are you doing? What are you doing to change the oil? How are you giving preventative maintenance? How is it that you say, uh, uh, how is it that we can say, I'm going to be here next week? Well, number one, you need to make the decision tonight, and then you need to you say, put it in your calendar. I get it. Things happen, things come up. But on a consistent basis, we ought to be the type of Christians who, when we miss a service, people go, hey, we're, we're so and so. Well, I call you after church and go, hey, is everything okay? I didn't see you here tonight. You say, oh, yeah, we got to fly a tie. Or, um, you know, whatever. Jamie and I got in a fight. <laughs> right, right. Pastor, where are you tonight? Uh, no, of course. And you made the decision. You made the decision to be there. Now, if you've got that uh, uh, pen and paper, you're all, you wrote those things down, and you can remember them. I think Brother Rodman's, Brother Rodman, when he preached, was a very uh, well-timed and very, very well put out. Uh, how do you how do, um, combat discouragement? 
Now, how, to, how, to, how to not be discouraged all the time. Uh, and, then, and then tonight, of course, was um, uh, how, how to do good your whole life. Who doesn't want to do good their whole life? Who don't, who don't want to do that? You ask any, any athlete, you can play until you're 50 if you'll do these things. Every athlete would be like, yeah, I would love to do that. I, I, I'd love to do that. I would still like to play basketball like I did when I was in my teens, but my knees are like, <laughs> don't think so. I don't think you can, Mr. Jackson. Just like can. And I go up and the next day I'm like, Ooh. I wouldn't be feeling that way if I would have done preventative maintenance all these years. You see, it takes effort. Nothing in this life comes that easy. Nothing is just a, a take it all besides the salvation, amen. The free gift of eternal life, which is wonderful. But folks, you want to do right your whole life? Then put these things into practice. Put them into practice. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening. Uh, I thank you for the truth. Lord, I know that you want us to do right. You said, now, 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 uh, now that we're, uh, uh, do it. Perform that which is good. Uh, Lord, um, as Paul said, though, he said, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. He said, I find a law in me. You know, again, I quoted it tonight, that the spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. Oh, Lord, I ask that you have pity on us that you remember our frame, you remember that we're dust. But Lord, being born again creatures, being born again into the family of God, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, justified, redeemed, made righteous, sanctified, there's no reason, there's no reason why we, why we have to live defeated. Why, why we can we make excuses for going about our life doing wrong. We can do right and do it till we die. Lord, help us to do that. The next generation is watching. Heaven is watching. Help us to do right. Do right till we see you face to face. Lord, we need your help to do it now. We can't do it on our own. We're, we're, we're sinners. We're sinful beings. We're in these bodies of flesh. We can't, we can't change that nature. But Lord, we've been given the new nature by Jesus Christ. Your spirit lives and dwells within us. Lord, please help us. Please help us. Deliver us, Lord, from temptation and from evil. Help us to get the victory this week. Bring us back on Wednesday. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.